This week's episode of Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico is brought to you by Baby Loves Tacos in its two locations in Pittsburgh, PA. The original hot spot right smack in the middle of Little Italy on Liberty Ave in Bloomfield and their second newer location in Millville right over the 40th Street Bridge. Zach, Kat, Kaz, John, Sandy... Ben, and the rest of those groovy cats serve up the best Mexican-style food this side of the Texas border. Huge burritos, tasty bowls, and the finest tacos around. Baby Loves Tacos will fill you up and make you smile. So when in Pittsburgh, head over to Baby Loves Tacos. Tell them Twisted Rico sent you. Baby Loves Tacos, where everybody eats. And I'm really happy that they sponsor my show every week. Thank you, Zach. You're the best. Joining us this week on Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico is Greg Allen from Greg Allen's Fringe Religion. Before we get into a heavy conversation about one of the greatest periods in rock and roll history, the early 70s, let's hear something from not so long ago. This is uh, from Greg Allen's Fringe Religion. This one's called, and I really like this one, She's Stoned on Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. Welcome to Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. You just heard she's stoned from Greg Allen's Fringe Religion. Please welcome back to the show my friend and longtime rocker, Greg Allen. How you doing, Greg? Fantastic, Steve. Great to see you again. <laughs> Before I jump into a couple of things, just tell us a little bit about recording that track and that whole thing, just so our listeners will know who you recorded it with, where you did it, and all the good stuff. We did that a couple years ago, maybe a few years ago now, up in Vermont, with Paul Coldry. He engineered it. He's a well-known guy. Yeah, it was Pete Weiss's <laughs> studio. Paul's done a lot of a lot of stuff, like the whole record. He's done uh, Radiohead, the Volcano Suns. He's 
played worked with everybody. Belly? Did he do Belly too? I think he did Belly. Yeah. Tons. He's got a huge history of uh, you know recordings, productions, and just engineering. Great guy. And uh, we, it was at Pete Weiss's studio called Verdant Studios, which was on like 20 acres up in Vermont by Saxton's River. And it was a beautiful place to record because you had your own, you know, you could stay there too. You had your own bedrooms and stuff. That's cool. And it was not, and you know, Pete's a great guy. And it was a big, this big, huge barn like thing. And it was cool. We had a good time and we recorded it pretty quickly. I think we did the basic tracks in one day. And we had just gotten a new drummer. So basically, we, Paul called me one night and said, You got anything? I said, Well, we just got a new drummer last week. And he said, Want to record? And we're like, Why not? So we taught the drummer the songs really quickly and went in there and recorded them. And uh, put it out, and Bump distributes it, and Bump, yeah, you're with Bump. Also, um, Jerry Nolan and the Profilers, you distributed previous well, band. Yeah, well, what it is, we have our own label called Straight to the Top Records, which we had my wife's label, you know, under her her name. Um, but and so it's Straight to the Top, and then we have distribution by Bump and distribution by another company in. England called Kudos Limited, which does the digital stuff for us. So, you know, Bomp and Kudos have been really nice to do that. And um, uh, we you're, you're na- your world, you're international wide now, Greg. Yeah, well, we always have been. We really got a new record coming out on um, uh, Ghost Highway in, in Spain. We have a seven inch coming out in the spring. And a full length album that we've been recording at my house that should be done hopefully by the spring or summer you're asking answering all the questions i was going to ask you i'll later. answer them again <laughs> <laughs> uh before we start talking about uh arguably the greatest four-year span in rock and roll history i say arguably i just want to clear up a couple things from the previous shows i don't know if you heard these shows greg but if you want to chime in feel free first during my interview with glenn stilfin basis of gangrene I did make an error and I wanted to correct that I stated that I saw Continental open for the Dropkick Murphys in Phoenix when the Dropkicks encored with gangrene's alcohol I was right about Rick Barton being there but I had the wrong band it was actually his previous band everybody out that toured with the Dropkick Murphys as you know Rick was the original guitar player of the Dropkicks so I just want to be clear on that the other thing is and uh, last week, Ben Diley interview, it's getting a great response. I completely missed when Ben said, and I quote, Ryan Adams R.I.P. Because, I'll tell you why. Um, he was talking about when they were in L.A. recording, it was Ben, Evan Dando, Juliana Hatfield, and Ryan Adams. It, it was 2012, I believe. I, didn't, I don't know every bit of controversy about all the celebs, because this isn't TMZ, you know? And I didn't know about the, all the sexual abuse allegations against Ryan Adams. I didn't know anything about that. I read something about it. Yeah. So so when it was later explained to me by my good friend Alvin Long, I felt like, wow, no wonder Ben didn't really want to get into that too much. If I had known about this, I would have never asked twice why the recordings would never release but now i hear hear some of these stories about ryan adams and i knew another guy named brian adams that i worked with at a&m and he wasn't very nice either so it must run in the family even though they're not related at all to each other they might it's be the adams family okay <laughs> i just wanted to clear that up I'm sure there have been other mistakes along the way, but trying to do my best to be as factual as possible. The real buzz on the last show was the Charles Manson talk, though. Tons of people have reached out to me about that in the last three days. And, and I would love to get Evan Dando to come on the show and explain this a little deeper. I guess I'll have to head out to Martha's Vineyard to find him because I usually see pictures of him on Instagram with a fishing pole. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, I didn't know about that. Did you know the Lemonheads recorded a Charles Manson song? I know. Well, I met Evan a couple times in New York uh, with Marlon Richards, I think. And I met him. He was thinking of playing on the actually the Jerry Nolan album. We had he had mentioned it prior to me having it come out. And I mean, he seemed like I love his songwriting. I think he's a great yeah, song. Yeah, he's an interesting character. So I got to ask you, man. Since March. <laughs> 
everything's been a little bizarre for all of us. How I know you work and you have a, a regular job, too. How have you been able to like adjust to everything that is the chaos that is 2020? Alcohol. <laughs> Which you go to. I'm uh, a red wine guy myself. Yeah, that's same here. Red wine, no beer anymore. But no, I don't know. You know, for the first couple, like first week, it was sort of weird, like living in a vacuum because you didn't know what exactly, how severe it was and how, you know, what exactly was going to happen. You know, it's kind right. of that looking into like this void of nothingness is like is it really you know if i go to the supermarket will i croak you know a week later so it was weird and then it kind of i felt a little more relaxed and less anxious but as far as recording stuff or, or writing music um it's a you, little weird you got your own studio now in your house right well, yeah we've been well we come they go in with a, you know, our guitar player brings a laptop in and we mic the stuff up in the basement or the attic or whatever room's suitable for what we need to have recorded and um so he does a great job doing that. So it's been we've been doing it at our house, and we've got about six songs done. But so you have you've been able to continue doing music even though it's been a turbulent time. Well, we stopped about a month ago because everybody was so many people getting infected with us. Even as a band, you know, if you're recording vocals and you're spitting all over the place, right, into a right. mic you or don't whatever, want to take everybody was like, let's just forget it for a while. So yeah. we, we've stopped probably you know until this kind of resolves itself a little bit more um, i know we met up a couple of times and you took me on some vigorous walks yeah. through the hills you took me up this big giant hill in swamp scott was yeah. it and then we headed down and then the ocean was right there yeah that yeah. was awesome yeah i know it's it's nice around there we would i was walking you know three to um somewhere between three and 10 miles a day when I wasn't back at work. I had been out for about three months. I'm presently back. No, I'm not. I'm on vacation for another month. But um, Oh, yeah. so you, did, you didn't You did go to work for a while. No, not for about three months. I was off for about three months. But myself and this other girl are back there. Um, for, uh, you know, there's not many people there, but um, I'm on vacation for the next month anyway. But uh, yeah. That's awesome. Good yeah. time to be on vacation. Yeah. Yeah, especially considered there's that surge and this yeah. stuff too you know it's <clears throat> i don't know it's the older people you have to concern yourself with, yeah you know your mom or dad or grandparents or whatever yeah well we're doing everything we can to uh to survive and i'm glad you're surviving um <clears throat> you know i absolutely love geeking out on music <laughs> in the 70s uh you know man the 70s was so good that you could talk about the 70s forever so i thought it would be a good idea to talk about the early 70s and i thought about greg because greg reads about as many music books and listens to about as many records as pretty much almost anybody i know <laughs> so i figured if i threw something out at you you would respond and you did yeah, so just take a look at me i mean you know <laughs> look at the guy and you go oh boy you know <laughs> So yeah, no, I'm you know a product of my generation. Yeah, plus you were in the you were part of the New York scene, part of the Providence scene, and part of the Boston scene. So you know the uh, the whole east, well, the Northeast anyway is pretty good, and um, you uh, have that Dolls connection too, you know. Yep. So so I came up with a list of twenty albums, <laughs> and I asked Greg to pick five that he wanted to talk about that meant something to him in one way or the other. And then I did the same. And I thought that we could both chime in on each other's list. So I'm going to let you go first, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce the, re the records that you talked about, and you can tell me why. The first one is the New York Dolls, self-titled, 1973. Now, I only put records in between 70 and 73 on the list just to prove what an amazing period it was. Yeah, there's a book on, it's called, I forgot the title of it, but it's specifically about music in, I think, 1971. Just that whole year and all the songs, great songs that were released. In, you got two from 71 on your list. <laughs> oh, do I? <laughs> yeah, you do. Well, you know, I, you know, I grew up being a teenager around that time and all that stuff was just, you know, it was like candy you know yeah for everybody who grew up in that generation or a lot of people it's changed after the 80s but you know the 60s and 70s 
I remember I had babysitters coming over with piles of records just playing them for me when I was a little kid. And you just, they would, you know, save their babysitting money and go buy records. And same probably with my generation and not so much later on. So so the New York Dolls self-titled record produced by Todd Rundgren, what's your whole thought about that record? I think it's a brilliant record. I think Todd Rundgren hated every minute of producing and recording it. And he thought it was probably embarrassing. Really? Yeah. I've read, seen a couple of interviews with him and he just just glosses over there. So, you know, Steve Jones from the Pistols had him on. And Steve Jones, a big, huge Johnny Thunders New York Dolls fanatic, was asking him on his show, uh, ZL, what's that show in? Um, uh, uh, Jonesy's Jukebox. Jukebox. But I forgot yeah. that it's in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's in L.A. And so station. they had him on and they asked him, you know, what do you, and you know what I really want to ask you, Todd, about that New York Dolls album? Todd's like, oh, well, there were a bunch of bands around there that they couldn't play their instruments. And, you know, I realized that one band had to kind of come to the top who was, you know, and he goes, uh, Johnny Thunders would come in, he was all sullen, and they'd just make everything really loud, and it was, you know, I thought I was giving New York City a gift. Instead, I just moved out of New York. Um, wow. he, he didn't seem like he liked it at all. He said they were just, you know, pushy and arrogant and loud and obnoxious, and that's what you want in a rock band. Yeah, meanwhile, <laughs> you get personality crisis, Jet Boy, Trash. I mean, I'm only naming three songs. That record was like Vietnamese loaded. Baby. Every single song on that, you know, I mean, and Jerry was never happy with the drum sound, and I think it was recorded pretty rushed, I think. Um, he wasn't happy with Todd Rundgren's drum sound. I don't think, <laughs> I, I, I don't think everybody was that happy with Todd Rundgren. You he know? was pretty young then. He was only 22 when he recorded that record, if you can Todd Rundgren? That. Yeah. Well, he had been, I think he might have did Grand Funk after that, and he did a lot of bad stuff. Bad Finger. Did he do Bad Finger too? <laughs> yeah. He was a great producer. Um, and I think, you know, some of his records are good and some of them are horrible, you know? I mean, like Something Anything's a great album. You know, Wizard of True Star is just, I don't, personally, it puts me into a coma. <laughs> but um, as far as being a, a producer, I think he, he's produced some, made stuff sound really great, but I don't know, you know? This is why I wanted you here, because I know that you would be, you know, you would use the Lester Bang school of, like, honesty here. Just call it him like I see him. You know, and it's only personal. So if you have any complaints, uh, let me just t say a couple of things about Todd Rundgren because I thought he had some really good songs. But if you look at his, they all came out around the same time. Like right. "Hello, It's Me." Yeah, that was a great song. Couldn't I just tell you? And he had a bunch of good songs, but then he went on and made a bunch of, I don't know what. To happened. face the music, he did that Beatles kind of thing. Then he did the Utopia stuff, and then he did. Some of his stuff's downright dull. It yeah, really I didn't is. really get into Utopia at all. I do like Todd Rundgren, but I did not get into Utopia. No, I me just either. It's couldn't. just that was sort of like, now I'm going to be a guitar hero. Look at me. Like, okay, you know, we've seen. He is unquestionably a great musician, sure. you know, so he probably got. <sighs> His head probably got really big because yeah. he was young. And then he said something about the Beatles. He made some comment about John Lennon, some snide comment. The letter. There was yeah. a letter. I remember hearing about that. And I just think, I don't know. I mean, you know, Todd, there used to be these cult, this cult Todd thing that was going on like in, when I was younger. Like, Todd said this. Todd will do this. <laughs> Listen to Todd's new record. I'm like... What the, you know, no. He did get Baby Buell, though, so he did something right. Yeah, he did. Well, I mean, probably because of his high profile. It certainly wasn't because of his looks. For people that don't know, Baby Buell is married to, I think Bebe, they're still yeah. married. BB. She had Steven yeah. Tyler's, you know. Liv Tyler's mother, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always get her name wrong, sorry. Um, so do you still, like, pull out the Dolls record now and listen to it? I do, uh, but not as much as the lived on my turntable when I was like 14 or 15, because right. it was just, you know, similar to like my experience with the first MC5 album. And Good segue, because we're going to talk about your second choice, which was, I think, their second record back in the USA. Yes, yes. and the guy who did Springsteen produced it. Made it John sound, Landau. Right, right. But um, the first Dolls album, sure, I actually bought another, you know, you could get it in the cutout bins when I was a kid because everybody in my neighborhood hated it. And everybody <laughs> I went to high school with hated it. And it was the same thing with the MC5 kick out the jams. We don't know you. We hate this record. They get that famous thing in the cream poll where they were best band and worst band. Yeah. 
<laughs> in the same poll, they were voted best band well, and worst band. The Dolls were about entertainment. Jerry used to tell me stories. He's like, at first they wanted to market the Dolls like the Monkees, where they were going to have a curtain. That's what Jerry told me, Jerry Nolan, the drummer. Yeah. And said they put the dolls in front of it, and they'd say, what are you, nuts? No, we're going to play our music. They're like, you can't play well enough. We're going to put a curtain behind you and have musicians behind you. And then um, they would do shows like, you know, old gray whistle test and the camera crew would go okay here's what we're going to do we're going to put you know f- we're going to photograph or uh, film the guitar player's fingers while he's doing a solo <laughs> then we're going to go to the drummer and you're hitting the drums and johansson would say what are you nuts take a, take a look at us you want to film the guitar player's fingers and he had a close-up of the take a look at this you know so they were all about kind of freaking you out and stuff and no one knew how to deal with them, but I loved the music, and both records were yeah. great. I got to see, I didn't see the original Dolls, but the Charms, when I managed them, did a 22-city tour, but it was Sylvain, Sylvain, and David Johansson. Right, I saw it. you guys, I saw the Charms twice on that. I saw yeah. them in Randall Island and in Rhode Island. But I they believe. were good, though. They were still good. They yeah, it was really a different thing. Band. You yeah. know, just Sammy Yaffa, who's a great guy and a great bass right. player. Hint, uh, Hint Steve, Rocks? Yep, Hint yeah, Rocks. Hint Rocks. And uh, Steve Conti, who was an excellent guitar well player. Well-known guy, yeah. They were good, but it wasn't the same thing. But, you know, they played a lot of the old songs, and it sounded good. Well, I'm glad we started with the Dolls, because I know you're a big fan. MC5, Back in the USA, 1970, produced by John Landau. You put that on your list. My favorite MC5 song, by the way, is Looking at You, and that's on that album. Great so, solo on that. So what does the MC5 mean to you? 70 is, like, really a crucial year, because... The 60s was so amazing. It was, what can you do to top it? And then, you know, MC5 comes along. Well, what happened, first of all, the guy at the end of the street, he was an army brat, taught me how to play the drums. You know, we used to go smoke catnip out in his, um, <laughs> in his uh, he had like a tool shed. Because <laughs> they couldn't get pot, so we'd smoke catnip, and I was like 11. And, you know, it was like smoking a banana peel. You just get right, a headache. Right. We'd get a headache, we'd go into his house and listen to Kick Out the Jams. I'm 11 years old. And, you know, his parents would complain, and he showed me a few things on the drums. And I was like, these guys are great, you know? And so I finally got the record, Kick Out the Jams, and they were immediately dropped, you know, because they said, screw... I don't know. Can you swear on the show or no? Oh, you say fuck All as right. many times it's, as they you had, want. It's, the MC5 put out, you know, <laughs> they wouldn't carry the record in uh, department stores, the MC5 Kick Out the Jams album, because they said, you know, kick out the jams, motherfucker. <laughs> and when they, you know, and, and so Hudson's wouldn't carry it in a, a line of department stores. So then MC5 took out an ad. This is while they were on Electro Records. And all the magazines that said, fuck Hudson's. <laughs> Don't buy any shit from them. So it immediately Electro threw them off the record label. And they got another deal on Atlantic. That's when, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Back in the, uh, back in that, the USA comes yes. out. Yes. And they had Landau produce it. And a complete polar opposite. sounded like a transistor radio compared to, you know, what you thought they were going to sound like. But the songs were great. You know, like uh, Fred Smith does uh, Shaken Street and Human Being Lawnmower and Teenage Lust. And they do a Chuck Berry back on the USA. That was a great song. Everything. I, that was another one. I remember buying it for $3.44 at Woolworths. Wow. You know, like I had to mow the lawn 17 times and, you know, wash the floor. Like, give me my $3. That's <laughs> funny. Like, like you know. the dolls, they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame either. Ridiculous. It kind of makes you feel a little strange about the this, way they do this. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is full I of mean, shit. We just, really we're talking about two bands that are so influential, the first two that you brought up. That uh, It must be all about money because Steve... <laughs> Steve um, Miller got on that said these guys are fucking assholes. They charge you like ten grand to seat your family at the at the thing, and you know they they march you in like you know you're a piece of meat. And he goes, they got to reinvent this whole thing. Yeah, we, they we could do a whole show about that. Mm. <laughs> so the MC5, um, I know that um, um, they did MC50. Uh, yeah, Bandanda uh, was in that one. Yeah, yeah, they had like all they've had all these people. The music seems to have gotten more popular as the years go on. Isn't that crazy? It's because the lack of anything better or more groundbreaking or more interesting. Um, Wayne Kramer, I couldn't think of his yeah, name. Wayne Kramer took right, it out in the road. Right, I saw his solo stuff. You know, he's a great guitar player. I saw him. 
jamming with David Johansson and Kim Simmons of Savoy Brown. And wow. David Johansson came over when I was at work one day and he said, ah, you know, he'd been drinking apparently. And oh, check this out, you know, take a walk with me. So me and this other guy walked over to Tramps and they were rehearsing this band that never came to be. And it was Wayne Kramer on guitar, David Johansson singing, Kim Simmons of Savoy Brown playing guitar. Wow. A couple guys from the Delancey Street Hawaiians. So me and this other guy from work just sat there that afternoon in Tramps watching them rehearse for like two or three hours. And it was fucking great. And the band just never really came to wow, fruition. I didn't know as about a group. that. I don't think anybody did because it never really, you know, showed up. You That's know? a good one. <laughs> Could have All been. Right. Let's see what else we got here. Well, this one right here, it's hard to argue your choice here. Rolling Stones, Sticky Fingers, 1971, produced by Jimmy Miller. Oh, he was great. I mean, you got Brown Sugar, Wild Horses, Dead Flowers, uh, Can't You Hear Me Knocking. Uh, those are coming off the top of my head. I know there was more. I mean, that record. The sway. Yep. Bitch. Bitch. Bitch was on that. And Wild Horses they did in Memphis, I believe. And I saw the receipt for it, and they just went and recorded it in Memphis while they were on the road. And the receipt was like $1,500 to do the whole song, like $400 for the tape and $1,000 for the studio time, and they cut it. And Mick Taylor played guitar yeah. on that one, right? Yeah. He played guitar on that all that whole that whole era with Jimmy Miller, which I think I, you know, is their best, uh, most productive time. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was a great do album. Do you know a lot about Jimmy Miller? I know that he had done, um, I think traffic? he had done Traffic. Traffic, yeah. He had yeah. done Traffic. And then later on, he did Johnny Thunders, and he did... Um, he did? Wow. Sure. He did that album in Cold Blood that was recorded in Revere, Massachusetts. And he did some stuff with Thunders that in um, New York, too. I believe the stuff that came out... Um, Johnny Thunders recorded in Revere? I recorded in Revere with Billy Rath, who, who was in Johnny's band. Johnny Thunders recorded at you know, Fourier Studios. He did an album with the guys, The Daughters. Joe oh, yeah, Mazzari, yeah. Joe Mazzari. Simon Ritt. Yep. Yeah. And um, they did, did an album called In Cold Blood. Some of it's, half of it's live, and I think half of it's in the studio with Jimmy Miller. Yeah, it was That's cool right. Stuff. I forgot about that connection with yeah. the uh, Joe and uh, Simon. Right. Because the daughters, they had that song, German Girls, that I used right. to play on my college radio The station. daughters used to do a lot of shows <laughs> being Johnny's opening band. Or they'd be in the band sometimes, and that's how my band in New York got acquainted with that, all those guys, through the daughters, you know, because they'd always open for them. Getting back to Sticky Fingers, um, what's if when you think about that record, what do you stick? What sticks out the most? The music, the playing, the all of it. I mean, what what really? Why would you put that on your list? Um. You know the album cover <laughs> and the inside sleeve with Keith Richards pushing his, you know, his hands the into album. his jacket to represent something. We should be talking you know, about the covers. Uh, You're right about it, that. That cover was <clears throat> the Warhol cover was ridiculous. And as soon as you put it on, every song on there was great. And you know, Brown Sugar was great. And it was just unbelievable. Great vibe. Great playing. Charlie was on fucking fire. That guy was he could swing. You know. And and that great rhythm section. Oh man, the horns and everything, the whole thing's black. The guitar, it was just a fantastic record, like Exile, like that one, like Goat's Head Soup. Goat's Head Soup, I love. By yeah, the way, all of that's them were great. Probably my favorite because till the next time we say goodbye. That's on. Um, that's on. Actually, it's only rock and roll. Uh, I'm sorry, it's only rock and roll. Yeah, that one too. I wrote the three Stones records that I liked, and that was those are the three right there yeah i don't know maybe it's only rock and roll is my favorite I, I, great I'm getting too. confused <laughs> the great stones rock. have so many the body of work i mean are they like one of your favorite bands yeah um definitely you know i mean i'm trying to think of the first you album like the stones better than the beatles don't you i like both of them and <laughs> a I, good answer i can't really say they're both they both came from the same elk they both were like the Stones were more blues oriented, and, and the Beatles originally more of a skiffle band, yeah. and kind of gener turned into something. You know, if you listen to Sgt. Pepper's and Magical Misery Tour, that doesn't sound like R and B. That doesn't sound like anything. It's an invented music that sort of was groundbreaking because it's you can't classify it as anything. Where the Stones still stuck with their blues, folky, country, a uh, jazzyish, you know, roots. You know, they really were influenced by Amer a lot of Americans, you know, because they ended up going to Chess Records right. when they were young. The Muddy Water Story. Yeah, they really were very influenced by Americans 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> This is a really good one, the next one you picked. 1973, Alice Cooper, Billion Dollar Babies. I mean, Bob Ezrin produced that. Yeah. That's rock and roll right there. I was listening to that last week in the car, and I hadn't listened to it in 20 years or something, maybe longer. And you just realize, you know, the Alice Cooper character. That record was like cabaret theatrical major production. And um, it wasn't like, you know, spooky Alice Cooper's going to hang himself, you know, spooky Alice Cooper's going to have the big snake. It was like, let's make this vaudeville and spend trillions of dollars doing it. All those parts that were recorded were like really detailed and specific. And it's not like, you know, these guys smoked a few doobies and drank a case of beer and recorded a record. This was time consuming and, you know, a major production. And, you know, I don't think Glenn Buxton plays that much on it. I think at that time he was kind of... Um, Figures you know, uh, you, uh, you probably know every guy that was in the Alice Cooper band. Yeah, and they had some other players, like, can, a, like a couple Canadian guitar players. And I, Hunter and Wagner also, who played with Lou Reed, played on that record, I believe. And, um, you know, original Neil Smith, uh, Dennis Dunaway... What I remember is elected because it was really funny that he came out with a song, I want to be yeah. elected. The video really. was great for it. Yeah, and then uh, um, No More Mr. Nice Guy. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that was a big hit too. I think No More Mr. Nice Guy was the big hit on that record. There's several Alice Cooper records, though, that yeah. you could rave about, man. Yeah, He's Killer just, and School's Out. Oh, man. Love It to Death. Even the early first two I loved. So do you really, he, he's probably the one that started the whole uh, horror rock scene, you know, that Manson, Marilyn Manson and all these people yeah. ended up following. Cooper's pretty much the main started. I'm trying to think who prior to that, who was doing stuff, you know, you had Arthur Brown, you know. The crazy world of Arthur Brown. And you yeah. had... Um, crazy entertainer guys but nobody who was gonna you know no one that commercialized the way alice cooper right did. and you know to, to make sure that your parents hated this fucking guy so the kids would go buy the records i think he was probably the first to do that and i don't know how that i think they you know they were hanging around with the gtos back then you know when they the two albums the first one zappa's label that they were on and zappa you know they sounded like an art band for the first two records but i don't know how the stick really came to fruition with a big um, spooky the and, show i saw cooper in the 70s it was just unbelievable i saw man. welcome to my nightmare and, yeah and then, i think that's 77 i think yeah. is when i saw i was like a 16 year old teenager i wish i had seen like love it to death or yeah killer or something yeah didn't he like hit, chop his head off or something he was hung <laughs> during killer i think you know i think he got his head chopped off and you know it's kind of corny now but when you're like 13 or 14 yeah, it's like, like seeing wow. Kiss. It was like, I'm not a big Kiss fan, but I remember in 1978 when I saw Kiss, I was like, oh my God. I saw Kiss, Black Sabbath with the headlining band, and Kiss opened for him. Oh my God. And they blew Black Sabbath off the stage. It was only because fire and bombs kind of trump yeah, the, uh, I you know, never, a guy with a spandex yeah, suit on. Because you wouldn't, like I would, and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't put music wise kiss in the same category as sabbath no it was, a, it was bad poor black sabbath get the shit pounded out of him a lot like van halen having to go you know, open for black sabbath and kiss and they always got blown off the stage it's not black sabbath were great you know yeah, i mean i loved I love their, all them. the records but it, unfortunately whoever uh, orchestrated those you know tour bills was not thinking <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> all right, you got one more on your list, and it's really hard to say anything negative at all about this record. The Who, Who's Next, 1971, Glenn Johns. I mean, it's probably, I'd say, for me, it, there's no way I could not have it in my top ten of all time. So you put it in your list, so you must feel close to that. Yeah, that album, too, was supposed to be a double concept album originally. It wasn't supposed to be the way it, it was supposed to be called Lifehouse. That was the original name of the album. Um, another kind of quadrophenia Tommy thing. And then the record company said, this is fucking stupid. Just use these songs. And I guess Glenn Johns narrowed it down to that group of songs. And everything on is great. Every you know? song yeah. is famous yep. on the record. Yep. Every one. My wife, John Entwistle, sings is yep. hilarious. You know, and you know, you got "Won't Get Fooled Again," yep. "Behind Blue Eyes," Barbara O'Reilly. I mean, yeah. these are the biggest hits the band ever had, really. Yeah. Along with "Little Love Rain on Me," which is a, on uh, Quadrophenia. Right. I mean, and Tommy had some hits too. But who's next? Would have to be the the 
the yeah. mother of all. Yeah, Lou records. I'd say. I never liked Tommy. Everybody would, Tommy's so good. And I'm like, this is fucking boring. And I never liked it. And I never got like the whole concept. I hated it, in fact. Liked Quadrophenia. I thought that was great. But who's next? Definitely my number one favorite if I had to select one. I'm not one. surprised at the, because you're like more into the real, like the, the records you picked here are real rock records, you know, like really like rock and roll raw you know and tommy doesn't fall into that category i mean i'm a i'm a rock idiot to a point you know i mean but you know i do like stuff with textures and i mean you know i love like bebop deluxe i love all you know their records and stuff but tommy just i don't know it just seemed kind of you know this is going to be exciting because now I want to see how you feel about my five sure. records that I picked. Okay. I recently became, I always loved the guy, but now I am so infatuated with Rod Stewart's early career when, after he left Jeff Beck Group and what he did. And I got Every Picture Tells a Story, 1971, which was sandwiched in between Gasoline Alley and Never a Dull Moment and produced by Rod Stewart. And the album's loaded with hits. Ronnie Wood, of course. I know oh, yeah. you love Ronnie Wood. Yes, I do. He's on it. Mickey Waller plays drums. And then he's got this guy, Long John Baldry, which not very many people know, but he does the background vocals on Every Picture Tells a Story. He does that really... I always thought it was Ronnie Lane singing it, but then I found out it was Long wow. John Baldry. The one song on the record, which is really unusual, because Maggie May, Mandolin Wynn, they were reasonably believe all hits. I'm Losing You, the old Motown cover. It's actually the faces that play on that Rod Stewart record. They were intertwined. They did yeah. the solo albums with them, then they did their own albums, and it just <clears throat> was a strange deal. How do you think Rod Stewart was able to keep two bands going like that? And they made six records in three years. How did he do it? I think he probably had some kind of agreement where the faces said, well, we're you know basically the small faces anyway, and we're doing you a favor. You know, and then he probably said, "Well, you know, I got this deal with this is I'm just assuming this would have something like that happened, and maybe the record company said, "You know that band, you know, who are back and who are really are great, and so maybe they said, "Well, why don't we do it like this? Rod will do his own albums and have you guys be the backup band, then you guys seeing that you have your own creative vehicle just without Rod, you know, because Ronnie Lane and Ronnie Wood and all those guys wrote, they can put out faces albums under the faces, and then it got to the point where it got kind of convoluted, and I think you know because Rod Stewart got pretty big, and then the Rolling Stones, you know, got rid of Mick Taylor, quit. And then Ron Wood went to the Stones while still being in the faces. And then Rod, as we all know, it went to Hollywood and yeah, I don't wrote know some happened. really <laughs> shitty songs. <laughs> I really love Rod Stewart, but he definitely let his career go in a... Like hot hot legs, I guess was yeah, okay. Yeah, was cool. But some of it... But you know it was funny during that period, because I did research this... All the American tours were the faces. He never went on tour at that time. Rod, right. is, he had to have Ronnie Lane and Ian McLaughlin and foil. those guys because they were great. They would go on the road and people would love the faces. Yeah, they kick soccer balls around and drink. Yeah. Them. They had a bar on stage, you know, and they drink pints of beer and it was, you know, a party band. Yeah, you know? the stories that Stewart ended up telling about some of the things that they did, the coke and all this stuff and they would they a lot of hotels in America wouldn't let them stay there so they started booking them their hotel rooms as Fleetwood Mac yeah and then they wouldn't <laughs> let Fleetwood Mac stay there and it was like the Peter Green Fleetwood yeah. Mac it wasn't like Stevie Nicks and uh, this is like even before that because I don't even know when that started this guy I used to work with hung out with the faces one night in Providence Rhode Island <laughs> he said it was just uh, it was just insane you know <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to go here to 1973, Lou Reed Transformer, his second solo record following uh, Velvet Underground. And the thing that fascinates me the most about this record, and I know you're going to like it, produced by David Bowie and Mick Ronson. <laughs> I mean, imagine those three guys together in a studio recording. Well, I think Ronson did pretty much all the string arrangements. And uh, it's a very weird combination. You wouldn't expect Lou to be tolerant of that kind of thing, you know, because Lou is pretty much in his own sphere. I think there might have been some extracurricular activity going on between some of the members. They were all on RCA Records, too, <laughs> which had a, you know, 
but I think there was the, the thread might have been um, I don't know what. Um, but I think uh, Bowie loved blues music, and I don't know if in the movie Almost Famous the scene where like Bowie's doing Lou and Lou's doing Bowie, but then Lou's doing Lou. You know that scene I'm talking about. I don't about? remember, but <laughs> Lou was an interesting guy. Apparently, I'd never met him. Did it, don't you think Lou Reed kind of tried to imitate Bowie for a little while there when he? Dyed his hair blonde. Well, he, he went got, over the top, and he yeah. put swastikas stickers in the in the side of his uh, in the side of when he shaved his head. You know, he did. Sure, wow. he did. That was when he dyed his hair bleach blonde, and he had the black fingernail polish. That was around metallic KO, and um, Lou was, you know, just try to get as much attention as he possibly could. I think he's one of those guys that his music has grown on me over the years, even more so because right. that album, a perfect day, that song, a perfect, I friggin' love that song vicious. And then of course, walk on the wild side is on that record, yeah. which is probably, I don't know. Is that his biggest hit? Probably. Right. Probably. Sweet Jane. Sweet Jane never became like a huge commercial success. I walk on. It did in side. my head. <laughs> Me too. And Martha Hubel's version was great too. Yeah. I thought. But um, <clears throat> the Lou Reed Transformer album just amazing. The sounds of everything that was recorded were perfect. They had that bass player played Walk on the Wild Side. That jazz guy, English bass player, played that riff. That riff is the most prominent thing that really carries that song. His name escapes me at a moment, but. Ronson's an amazing guitar player. We don't player. know everything, people. We're trying our best here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to pull names out but of the hat. I love the record. I put it on my list. The next record I have here is the first Queen album, oh, yeah. which is probably the least one of the, except for Hot Space, that record did not get received very well, no. even though it had the big hit with Keep Yourself under, Alive. Pre under Pressure. No, I'm talking about oh, Hot Space. Yeah. Keep Yourself Alive was on this record with Liar and Doing All Right. But they were like a glam band back then. It was Roy, Roy Thomas Baker produced it. He went on to produce five records with them, the first five. But no one really talks about the first Queen record, but I think it's a brilliant... It's, it's a glam rock record, basically. I got it when it first came out, I remember, and... Uh I don't know why I got it. I think I like the cover. Probably heard Keep Yourself Alive Maybe. on the radio. I don't know if that was that big of a hit then, but that was their only hit. And I, and the reviews said stuff like, this band is awful. They're like a Walt Led Zeppelin wannabe. And I, I found not, nothing like that. You know, I just thought it was the whole different kind of thing. I thought it was a great record. The second Queen album was a little different. And, I, you know, when the third one came out, that was just mind-blowing. It, it's kind of sad that a lot of people didn't really appreciate Queen until like you know, live aid. <laughs> I know, it's I mean, ridic where ridiculous. Where, I don't know. Where the fuck were well, they? Well, no, they had hits, you know, like Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody. That was on, you know, that was a big hit for them. And, um, you know, but they really didn't get, they well, in a, England, in England, you've got to realize. They were if, big there. Huge. I'm talking about America. Yeah, America, they, they were yeah. never as big in America as they were in England. In England, they were just monstrous, you know. In America, they were like, oh, you know, the, the, were popular and made a lot of money, and, but they weren't like anything like they were respected in Queen. After Freddie's death, though, in, in England, sorry. it's like all of a sudden hey, everyone knows Bohemian Rhapsody right. now. Of course, uh, Wayne's you, World. You know, you mentioned Zeppelin. I had to. There were three records of theirs that came out during that period. I have it in my notes here. Led Zeppelin three and seventy. Led Zeppelin four and seventy one. And Houses of the Holy in seventy three. I took Led Zeppelin three because Tangerine, first of all, is my favorite Led Zeppelin song. And, you know, Jimmy Page, that's the other thing that I love about when you think about Zeppelin. Jimmy Page produced. That record also had the Immigrant song, which is, you know, enormous. And since I've been loving you. And were you a Zeppelin fan? I was, but I, not to... Uh, you know, be a bummer, but I didn't like the third album. I loved Houses of the Holy. I loved the Wait first Wait a minute, album. you didn't like the one I picked? No. Thanks I, a lot. I, I hated it. <laughs> and I didn't like the second one either. But I thought the first one was fantastic. And I thought, you know, Houses of the Holy was unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, you know, the the one with Stairway to Heaven on was great. I liked Four. it. Four. I, I, I didn't Four. care for Presence. I didn't care for Into the Outdoor, but there were three of them that were just 
fantastic. And it's all personal because obviously I'm the only one who feels that way. Because, you know, each record sold probably 70 billion <clears throat> records. I wasn't a huge Zeppelin fan when I was growing up. I, ju- I just wasn't. I was more into Queen and Sabbath. Those were my two favorite bands yeah, me too. in the 70s. You know, I didn't like, I had an ex-girlfriend, Chili Kurtz, you know her. Yep, and I've met her. She's been on my show a few times. She worships worshipped Zeppelin and I used to have fights with her all the time about I used to say I like Brian May better than Jimmy Page and we get in these fights <laughs> we get in these but you know what I've grown grown to appreciate Zeppelin more as time has gone on but I don't know why I think I just I don't I it's okay that you said you hate this album don't but, hate it but it's not my favorite <laughs> but you know Tangerine I don't know why I just love that song I just can't like talk about zeppelin without talking about tangerine it's just to me because you know a lot of the early stuff he ripped off from early blues songs sure. and ended up paying all these lawsuits and everything i'm talking about jimmy page yeah i know he was notorious but for that. plant i think is is definitely top 10 vocalist for me and john paul jones and the drummer bonham of course yeah, i did i i got burnt out on the bonham thing every drummer that i play with or have played with like Bonham, check it out, boom, 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 boom. Okay, stop. Yeah, to you know? me, he wasn't Ginger Baker. Or no, Keith he Moon. was a clumsy, I, I love, buddy rich. Yeah, it's funny <laughs> we have an en- we have a engineer, uh, a drummer that's engineering the show, and he's probably enjoying this part. Uh, I, I re- talking about Nick Z in the other room. Right. I really loved Ginger Baker and Keith Moon better than probably still. They're my two favorite drummers. Probably to this day. There were a bunch of, like Jerry Shirley from Humble Pie was unbelievable oh, yeah, for really that kind good. of big beat drummer. Charlie was a jazz drummer. He did great swing. Ring, these are Ringo. All, everybody, Ringo was Ringo good was too. great because his parts were, you couldn't, it's not like Ringo was a great technician, but he would approach a song like, he his parts that he would put in there were just amazing. And Roger Taylor was a great drummer. I love Queen, Roger Taylor. And he didn't sound specifically like anyone. And Bonham sounded, everybody loved him because he was real heavy with a kind of jazz setup. And like to me, he was a clumsy Buddy Rich. And he was an excellent drummer. He was. For that band, he made that band, you know. However, every drummer in the world thinks that if they emulate him, like right down to the guy who played with Billy Squire, the guy who played in that band Detective with Michael DeBar. They it just sounds like you Bonham know too much. Well Bonham <laughs> sounds like Bonham joined the band but second rate versions of it. And you get guys who want to join your band and all of a sudden they or the play you know, no. I Please be ask, yourself. I have to ask you a drummer question, because you know your drummers. I played drums. Uh, yeah, I know you started as a drummer. I did remember that. You started as a drummer, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I still that. play every day. I mean yeah. I gotta get down. So. Um I have a friend, I won't mention his name, who thinks that this guy's horrible, and I want to get your opinion. Kenny Jones. Kenny Jones is a fantastic drummer. He was a <laughs> horrible drummer for The Who. He was Yeah, awful. he couldn't play The Who. He was right. just, fire him in a second, I would have. But he was great in the Small faces. Small faces, too. You know? He was a fantastic yeah. drummer, had his own unique style, still is, but he was a bad choice for The Who. They've got Zach Starkey now. Um, who, I like Zach, Ringo Zach Sun, Starkey, yeah. Who Keith Moon taught to play, yeah. and I've seen them with him, and he's fantastic. He was an oasis. He was in a lot of little, yeah, he was a he great, did. great drummer. It's Perfect. funny because Keith Moon and Ringo were good friends, and yeah, I did hear that, that, that the kid learned more from <laughs> Keith Keith Moon than he did from his own yeah. father. Isn't that funny? I got a good Keith Moon story about a guy in Boston some other time now. <laughs> right, I got one more record on my list here because we're really we're really geeking out on this one. Uh, this uh, the, this whole show, I mean. Lastly, I had to put this on my list. George Harrison, All Things Must Pass, 1970. Third solo record produced by Phil Spector. Isn't it a pity? What is life? Beware of darkness. And of course... My sweet Lord. The lineup, though, kills me. Eric Clapton, Klaus Vorman on bass, and the crazy, speaking of drummers, the crazy Jim Gordon, oh, yeah. who ended up murdering his yeah, mother. with a hammer. Yep. He was, uh, he played on so many. Clapton, Layla. Lackets. He did, I think he played piano and drums on Layla. Yeah. But did you like All Things Must Pass? No. I thought it was boring. 
and you know, kind of like you uh, hated two of my records on my top I, I just, five. There were some good songs on there, and the, I think Spedding played on that record. Well, I was and I think nice to you Peter about Fra- your records. I think records. Peter Frampton played on All Things Must Pass too. There's some great players, probably. But it was just Billy Preston. You said, yeah. yeah, Billy Preston. It's just when the, you start getting a three Ringo. album set, Ringo, you're yeah, great. But when you start getting three albums sets. You know, yeah, like, it's a lot. like tales of topographic oceans. But yes, like who wants to listen to that shit? I don't. You know, you got to be stoned out of your fucking mind and just you know, like you're not into prog at all, prog rock. Somewhat, a little bit. You know, like that band Stray from England, they were kind of proggy rock. And did be- you like Bebop early Deluxe. Genesis? I like or, the Lamb uh, Lays Down on Broadway. Is a great album. King Crimson. Some of it. Some of it got a little bit too. Roxy in- Music. Um, I don't want to get, you know, Stranded's a great album. My particular, I don't get Roxy music as much as a lot of people. I think, again, here's opinionated Greg's, you know, babbling, but I just think they're kind that's of boring. Here, I, think, I think they're boring in a way. <laughs> and I think Stranded had some great songs on it, but that's a Chris Thomas production. He did the Pretenders and the other records just didn't have that excitement for me. I but like I, I think they're all great records and well written songs and great performances. I like Maybe Manzanera. Not I like Phil Manzanera. Great guitars. And Chris player. Spedding is one of my favorites, yeah. and he's on all that stuff, yeah. too. Um, so you don't really have much to say about all things must pass. <laughs> no, I think there's, you know, My Sweet Lord, didn't you get sued for that? <laughs> yes, by, he uh, stole the song. Yeah, right. We so know that. there you go. But, Three you know, albums Jimmy and Page still... did, too. So, you know, right. I mean, some of these guys. I've is... <laughs> been to Friar Park before. I've, I, my girlfriend had a house about a block away, and i got to tell you, I've never seen anything like that. I only stood at the, the gate out in front. And it looked, there was a huge mansion. It was like the size Him of a town. Him and tower. Patty Boyd lived there, right? I never got inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you I, hung out with Patty Boyd no, and Clapton no, and no, Harrison. No, unfortunately, no. that never, never, that never happened. Okay, so just to give people a little reference here about where the list came from, the original list, I'm just going to go down this list. And if you want to stop me at all at any time about any of these records, uh, Elton John, Yellow Brick Road. It's a good album, great album, double album. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Stayed on the charts for, what, 10 years straight? Neil Young, After the Gold Rush, 1970. Great songs. Uh, Chicago's second record. They were great, great horn section. Then they got Cheese O'Rama hit hard. Yeah, they really, t- after Terry Kath. Yeah, he was yeah, great, Terry Kath. Their guitar player was great. Um, Grand Funk, Closer to Home. Uh, wow. Uh, Goat's Head Soup. I know you like yep. that one. Uh, Paul McCartney and Wings, Band on the Run. Great album. I like yeah. that. It's still exciting, kind of, and interesting. I almost picked this one. Uh, a Face is a Not is As Good as a Wink, 1971. That's great. Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust, 72. Down below, you know. I bet you you don't like this one. Yes, Close to the Edge, 72. <laughs> <laughs> this one will really excite you. Steely Dan can't buy a thrill. Seventy two. No, thank you. Ricky, don't lose that number but, though. But you know the thing is that Derringer on that album, and now that they're not really well defunct or whatever, some of those songs are interesting. The subject matter were just so <laughs> screwed yeah. up. That, it was, they were great. I just kind of overlooked that. Even they Asia. were a little too smart. I almost did yeah, for rock a little and roll, too you know cerebral for you know. I like Brownsville Station. I mean, better they're than like them. Westchester <laughs> County, New York band. I mean, yeah, you know, I think they were college. They went to the they Jewish to, community in Westchester. They went County, to college together, <laughs> and they started <laughs> that, you know, band. Uh, Humble Pie Smoking. Great, great. Yeah, record. that was 1972, and we mentioned the Zeppelin records, and that was it. There was a lot more records I could have put on the list, but I don't know why. Those are the ones I picked out. If there's anything that you can remember from 70 to 73 that I left off, other uh, great records. I mean, that Brownsville Station Yeah album was unbelievable. Did that have Smoking in the Boys? From it did, it? but everything else on it, you know, like Barefootin' and. They're just great rock and roll songs. That was a great uh, underrated Leave it to album. Greg Allen to pull out Brownsville Station. It's, just, it's a fantastic wow. record, and that record was great. And obviously, Mott the Hoople, the Hoople, and Mott the Hoople, Mott and Mott oh, the yeah. Hoople, all the young dudes, and uh, Bebop Deluxe records, Sunburst Finish, amazing. Talk about prog rock. These guys could do prog rock, reggae, rock, glam, all in one and make it cohesive. I think All American Alien Boy by Ian Hunter came Great. out in 74, and that's why it wasn't on my list, because I love one. that album. I like the first one the best, like, with, once bitten, twice shy, and 
three thousand miles from here, five thousand. The, the reason I like All American Alien Boy is because Irene Wilde is one That's of my great, favorite great songs. Song. Plus, yep. Queen plays on, and Jaco Pistorius oh, plays wow. bass on the whole album. He was out there, great <laughs> a- bass player. Ainsley Dunbar, I think. Yeah, was he was in drum. Jefferson Airplane. He was in Zappa's band for a while. We're getting deep now, man. Yep. Well, listen, man. This has been a lot of fun. It probably went a lot longer than I thought it would, but I, I, I'm happy. And I want to ask you one other thing before I play a song. I, you got into it a little bit at the beginning. What are your future plans, Greg, as far as what you're doing with your band, with your studio, with your future recordings? Are you recording the stuff? Now, what do you, what, what's going on? Give us a quick rundown. I've got to grow up. It's the first thing I've got to do. You know, I've been stuck you in you know, to Led Zeppelin three. I got to listen. Home. Yeah, you know, I'll be you know, strapped down and listen to that record. You know, like they're doing Clockwork Orange. How they got my eyes kind of held open. And like, no, no more. Um, what What am I doing? I don't know. Good question. I, well, I don't know. I just get up every morning and try to get through the day. Nick Z's in the next room. He's waiting to master your next record. I hope he does. He did a fantastic job on the first one. Um, well, you know, like I said, we're finishing up a record that we're recording at our house, my house, my wife's house. I don't know who owns the place. You know, it could be a rental for all I, I know. I'm drunk the all the time. For it. By the way, if you, Heather listens to this show, she sent me a, a, a Christmas gift, a bag of candy. Thank you, Heather Stewart. For, I appreciate that very much. She's a great artist, your wife. She is. She's going to be president of Salem Arts Association starting in Fantastic. January. Fantastic. So, Steve, you should get some of your artwork in there. Thank you. Should you. Check I it would, out. I, Yes. Um, what we're doing, we're going to finish the record. We were thinking of putting a, out a, on vinyl, a 12-inch, uh, but then we're kind of on the fence about it because, you know, not many people are buying that much vinyl. I just saw this thing on that band Cracker, the guitar, David Lowry. And right, he's like, right. I've got tons of vinyl that I can't even <clears> sell, and he's a pretty big artist. So we're just going to be a full-length record. We've got the single coming out in Spain on um, Ghost Highway. Marco, who runs the company, fantastic guy. Hi, Marco. I'm sure you're listening to this in Spain. Um, and then we hey, love- we're international, man. I've got listeners all over the world, so yeah, he probably will. I hear hope it. he hears it. And uh, then we're gonna, you know, we've got distribution with Bomp and Kudos. Excellent we'd company. love to go over to Europe. Basically, we'd like to go over there and play. Um, I've got friends in Spain and England and uh, France and stuff, and we'd just like to go over and play. But in the meantime, we're gonna finish these records and hopefully just to get some gigs around town. Or out I can't of town. wait to see you live again. It's been a while. Yeah, now. we're looking forward to playing again. I don't remember the guys in the band anymore because it's been so long <laughs> but yeah, i'll recognize him after i spend a few minutes with him well, um, f- well thank you dude appreciate you coming on the show i, I appreciate your knowledge that's why you're here you have great a great knowledge of rock history we can do another show we can even go further back if you want sounds fine. i don't know if you like the 50s 60s 80s forget the 90s and beyond yeah but before that there's some good things that i'm like 70s 60s 80s 90s and 80s wasn't a real productive time music independent was, independent that cool a lot stuff of good, was yeah yeah like the replacements and black oh, yeah, flag and all those kind of bands all bands. came sure. out you know sure well thank you dude it was thank great you having you um next week we're going to do things a little different here um i guess you could say um it's going to be a holiday special, although I'm not calling it that. I'm going to play music, pretty much all music for the whole show, talk in between some of the songs, and we're going to have a Twisted Rico radio show. <laughs> in fact, here's a little preview. I got a song for you. It's going to be a lot of my favorite songs. Probably have another Greg Allen song on next week. Um, this is a gem from a band called Hello Dragon. This track's called Stephen Hawking on Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I try to imagine The cold beginning of time It's elegant shadows Pushing and pulling Particles flying Number 
was Hello Dragon from the 2008 album The Quantum Explorers, produced by Chris Zerby, who also wrote the tune and plays it along uh, with, at the time, his sidekick Julie Chadwick. Old, these guys are all good friends of mine. I haven't seen e- either of them in a while. They're out in California. Julie played guitar and background vocals on that. Dave Foy on drums. Michael Eisenstein, who also co-produced the record with Chris and... Uh, Josh Pickering on keyboards. Of course, that was an ode to the great physicist Stephen Hawking. (laughs) You know, like I say every week, it's really important that we continue to support the mom and pop and independent stores out there like Baby Loves Tacos, who we mentioned at the beginning of the show. Places like the Moonbeam Cafe in Oakmont, PA. Spectacle Eyewear in Boston, the Dark Horse Pub right here in Somerville, the Record Archive in Rochester's, Anna's Taqueria, which is all over the Boston area, 1369 Coffee Shop in Inman, and actually this morning I went to the Diesel Cafe in Davis Square in uh, Somerville and I got my iced tea. And I want to mention my... um, a, a store in my hometown of Webster, Mass., Book Lovers Gourmet. They've been doing a great job. These these stores need us more than ever now. So whatever you can do, whether it's takeout food, ordering merch, buying your favorite metal bands, record, whatever, please. Same goes for our engineer here, Nick Zio. I want to thank. He's been doing an absolute fantastic job. If you have anything you want to record or master, get in touch with Nick. Easy to find. New Alliance East South Somerville, Mass., And I want to thank our patrons, including our newest patron, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Mary joined us this week, and I was really happy to see that. Uh, If you want to support the show, go to patreon.com forward slash Twisted Rico. If you have any questions, comments, whatever, twistedrico at gmail.com. There's also now an Instagram page that I set up. Uh, called uh, Blowing Smoke with TR. It's at Blowing Smoke with TR. I'm going to post a lot of photos and things there that I wouldn't uh, post anywhere else, so keep an eye on for that. And also, we have a Facebook page, and we're on, some of our shows are on YouTube. So once again, uh, stay tuned next week. We'll be doing the completely different kind of show, which I'm psyched about. We're going to play a lot of music. This is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. Till the next time we say goodbye, keep the rock and roll alive. We love you, Busy Phillips. And let me just tell you, the charm's so pretty. I never mention it. The opening track, the ending track, co-produced by my engineer here, Nick Z, in 2004. 
Take care, guys. Thank you.